Hello, everybody. I am beside myself excited and actually in basically a full body sweat because I thought my computer wasn't working, but it is because I get to introduce you to the legendary Tamron Hall and talk about her book, which kept me up the entire weekend. I loved it so much. Um, and so I'm gonna just start by just introducing someone who needs no introduction and get us to talking. And then please, please put questions in the chat. I'm happy to ask anything um, that you guys wanna know. And I will try to warn if there's gonna be any sort of spoiler because this beautiful book just made its way into the world yesterday. So I'm gonna be very careful not to ruin anything, but if anything even seems like it's on the edge of that, I will give a warning. Um, so this is, as I said, someone who needs no introduction, Tamron Hall, the host and executive producer of the nationally syndicated show, Tamron Hall. Formerly of the Today Show, she has hosted six seasons of Deadline Crime on, the, on Investigation Discovery. While at NBC, she was a recipient of the Edward R. Murrow Award for her report on domestic abuse. Tamron currently serves as an advocate for domestic violence awareness as The Wicked Watch is her first novel, the first in a new series starring Jordan Manning. So for those of you like me who are have started, finished, and you're in love, the first thing I'm going to ask, because I'm so excited, is this, this is one of many that we have to look forward to. Is that true? Yes, this is, uh, well, uh, one of, in my mind, my dream, first of all, uh, let me stop to thank you for your time and for your generosity in moderating this conversation. Thank you for being an inspiration on so many levels. And I'm just uh, very, very fortunate to have someone like you, you know, shepherding me through this evening of great conversation. So thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, because I know there are many things you could be doing tonight. And, and you did, full disclosure for anyone watching, she was working really hard to get this. She's like, I'm getting this computer together. Da, da, da. And it, just to see that was amazing. That's how committed. And, and I felt the same way. I just a few minutes ago was doing a tour of a, a, a preschool for my son. So I understand that energy of running in and being in this moment. Um, yes, this is a series I recently thought in my head, well, my birthday was September 16th. I turned 51. The third season of my show, uh, September 6th premiered, yeah. and then October 26th, the debut of this novel. So I said, okay, we're going to make 666 lucky for once. And yeah. so I'm thinking six would be the goal. I'm about four chapters in um, to the second book, and I'll tell you more about that. But it's it's been so surreal these past few days, uh, promoting the book and hearing from amazing female authors like yourself. Oh, and by the way, that thing you hear, that is not my smoke detector. That is my bird, Jojo, who wants oh my to God. Show, I have a bird, Josephine Berker. This is my dining room and Josephine is on the other side. She wants to be in. So please don't think that I am negligent in changing my smoke detector battery. That is Jojo it. and she can hear me talking <laughs> and she's curious who she's I'm talking excited. to. She's <laughs> Well, if I can start by just backing out, you have had a notable career. I mean, so successful, an award-winning talk show host, television reporter, um, a recipient of some of the hugest honors you can have in journalism. What made you decide to venture into writing a crime series from there? Um, to be honest with you, I it wasn't a deliberate decision, right? It was very organic. I think now that the book is officially out and I'm able to reflect on where I am as a woman, you know, I'm, I'm 51. And while I have um, been very um, lucky to have achieved certain milestones in my career that I never expected as a kid from Luling, Texas and you know, and, and, and having that spot on the Today Show and losing it and figuring out how to get back up and having this talk show and, 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 and battling to stay uh, in the game of television. There, there are things that feel um, right in my life. And this felt like the right decision. But I, I wish, Laura, I could take you to a moment where I said, hmm, 
I know, a novel. I had this break in my career for the first time since age 14. I, I've worked from Toys R Us to selling jewelry where I was paid under the table. It was like, oh, wow. Um, you know, all kinds of side jobs. And one of my most dreadful jobs was I worked in an office and this woman had us licking the stamps to put on because she didn't like the little wet tab sponge. I mean, I just the strangest jobs you can imagine from 14 to 48. And so for the first time I was without a job and my immediate focus was, you know, getting back to doing what I do, which is reporting and being on air. Mm -hmm. And then at some point in the conversation with my, my agent, Bradley Singer, who's become a family friend, I said, you know, I want to write a book. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, like a memoir, like, you know, inspiration yeah. because you're so inspirational or what about, you know, this? And I said, no, I want to write a novel. And he, you know, a novel. And I started to explain that in 1997, um, there were two cases that I covered that haunted me and still do um, to this very moment we are speaking. In Texas, the death of a young girl, age 11. And then the same year when I went on in my career to go to Chicago, this great news town, I covered another 11 year old girl who'd been murdered. And I stood um, inches from where they went to school, where they played and where they died. And both of those stories, um, I now recognize left some form of trauma in my mind and in my heart. And that sounds strange to even say, because at the end of the day, I didn't lose a loved one. Their mothers, their family members and their friends did. But there was some attachment emotionally to those stories that led me to this character and reconciling some of the emotions, fears, and sadness that reporters don't discuss publicly. Mm. And so it was born from this that um, I said to Bradley, I've got this idea. I jotted it down. He introduced me to my book agent. Eve Adderman, she loved the idea immediately. And I started to feel more confident sharing this, mm -hmm. this character and, and, and this story. Well, because it, you know, one thing that struck me about the book was it feels to me, and it, it makes sense because in so many ways, the work you've been doing involves um, helping sh shape narratives, helping people come to understand things, helping, uh, your audience understands stories that you have access to, people you're talking to, but you feel like such a natural storyteller. Like it's that sort of story that I always say my favorite books are books that I could imagine being that they're being read out loud to me. Yeah. And that's how that that's how that feels. So it's just it's so it's so interesting to hear how you came to it, because it almost feels like you've been living with these stories uh, for a long time. That's how that's how the book reads. That's exactly how I feel about your books as well. It, it, there's a feeling of connection and you can hear the voices. And so for me, I recognize this is my first novel and the structure and the organization and things that skilled writers like yourself have mastered. Um, I'm, I'm a baby in this, right? At 51, I'm finally able to say I'm a baby at something. <laughs> However, I had... 30 years of experience um, that I could bring to this character, both as a participant and as a witness in the newsroom. And then I was able to layer in six seasons of deadline crime, where again, I found myself in intimate spaces and places with survivors of crime, with detectives who'd solved crime. And largely though, most of those detectives were men and no. most of the stories were survivors and victims who were white. Mm -hmm. And with me, the two cases, as I said, one happened to be a white 11 year old girl. One happened to be a black 11 year old girl, but they both were kids Yeah, and they both had friends mm -hmm. and they both, you know, probably right now would be, um, you know, on their way to college and oh living their dream. And so oh for God. me, that was the connective tissue 
I said, I'm going to lead with my heart as a writer. Mm -hmm. I will grow and I'll learn the mechanics and I'll learn the beat and I'll learn the tone. I'll learn all of that, just as I did as a reporter to get mm -hmm. to where I am. But when I first left Temple University, I landed my first job, not because I had the skill. I went in there like, listen, I got it. I've got, you know, I'm going to get into the community. I'm going to do this. I'm going to volunteer. I'm going to get to know. And I sold the news director on the idea that I wouldn't just be a reporter who came to town and left. And I was going to be a reporter who got to know. I was going to join a church. I was going to join the Y. I was going to be a part of it. And yeah. so that's what I felt I could bring as a writer to this amazing community of mystery writers was my heart and create this character from that space. I mean, it, that really that really comes through, which brings me to your main character, brings me to Jordan Manning. Um, and my question about her is that for me, well, she joins the ranks of several other uh, fictional sleuths, but she's one of the very few black female characters in this role that I've, at least that I've read. And was that an important factor for you in starting this series to sort of um, expand this representation of black women in crime fiction? I had no idea that this mm -hmm. was the case, to be honest with you. It never occurred to me. I grew up with the Nancy Drew book set under my bed. So it, for me, Nancy Drew wasn't white. She was Nancy Drew, right? Yeah. And that's, that's how I saw it. And when I went into meetings with Eve and Bradley, um, it was only then that I learned, oh, we've not seen a protagonist like this. Yeah. And the team at William R. and Harper Collins said it, and I thought, okay, they're just flattering me. Really, come on, it's 2021. <laughs> Are you kidding me? And then I said, well, it wasn't until, I don't know, 20, whatever year I joined the Today Show after 60 years that I was the first black woman to anchor the Today Show. So might it be possible that mm -hmm. this type of character doesn't really exist. And that blew me away, but it also confirmed to me I was on the right track, right? Yes. I, okay, this is it. I, and it, there were these little nuggets of the universe saying to me, you're on the right track, keep picking up the breadcrumbs. And so that was one of the big ones that, okay, this is, this is interesting. And then I said, but I don't want her just to be, oh, she's the black protagonist because I'm not, you know, Tamron Hall, the black host. I hope that I'm Tamron Hall, your friend who's unapologetically black and Southern, and you can hang out with me any day. As yes, long yes. as you're cool, fun, nice, and, and that's it. The, the only prerequisite is that you can perhaps drink two mimosas. That's all that, you know. <laughs> that's, so, that's, for, that seems like a perfect prerequisite. For, yeah, right. And so for yeah. me, that's what I wanted this character to be. However, I wanted the audience to appreciate that she mm -hmm. was a black female yeah. and understand her life and perspective and mm -hmm. why Macy James and that case and the cases she learns about in this hotline call, why they matter to her and why the stakes are high enough for her to cross this line of reporter and enter into what she's not even clear what she's doing when she mm -hmm. starts to investigate it. Well, so one of the things I love so much about, about her was she's complicated. I mean, mm -hmm. she is fun and interesting. And, but what I love is like, almost when you get to see a character get messy, get involved in, in some way um, and, and think about the, what you would do differently. I hope I would be as brave as she is. Um, and so that leads me to wonder in what ways do you feel that you're like Jordan Manning, who I love? And in what ways do you feel like she became something different, diff not different from you, but I'm not asking for biographical. I mean more, in what ways is she sim does she have sim similar um, characteristics to you? And in what ways is she different? I think at her age, she's far more assertive than I am. I think I have, as, as someone said to me, I speak with a very strong voice, but... Mm -hmm. My no's are never real no's. Everyone in my family circle, if I say no, and I say it very emphatically, no, and then three minutes later, I'm like, okay, fine, what are we doing? You know, and so, uh, but she's, she's a bit more um, certain of her no's. She's certain of 
um, where she stands. And I wasn't at that age. I think people perceived me to be, mm -hmm. but I certainly was not. And that's a big difference in us. And that is why she's able to cover this story in a way that I didn't in real life cover those two stories where I had questions about the news coverage and I might have in my mind held and gripped the microphone tightly thinking in my mind, I'm going to blurt out, you know, <laughs> this is what, listen, I'm not going back to you. What I'm going to do is this right now. I would have been carried off and never seen again on air. Yeah. She doesn't say that, but she takes a stand in ways that I was much more aware of the consequences. And yeah. I mean, in our, our, our love life, which I what it was important for me to explore her love life. Yes. Um, when life and work collide, when work is 24 seven, I wanted um, the reader to intimately know what, what is it like to be, you know, on TV and you have people calling and they want to go out and they're interested in you and, you know, and also be, um, she's, she's liberated her, you know, in her sexuality, she's not trying to be married and it's okay for her as a young single woman to maybe, you know, I guess in back then they called them booty calls, but I wouldn't call it that. <laughs> no, I wouldn't call it that. Um, but it's okay to have a romantic liaison. And again, other than waiting to exhale, you know, that, that sexually liberated woman of color, was important for me to layer it in, but it's also critical in the world um, of journalism where when I first started out in the business, someone said, look me square my eye and said, this is a lifestyle, right? Wow. This is not a job. This is a lifestyle. Everything yeah. you see, when you're at the grocery store, you will see a story idea. When you are here, this, this is a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And when it's a lifestyle, how does that impact your life? Yes. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, yeah, I, I really love that because also I feel like so often in fiction, you see a woman depicted a certain way, almost waiting for Prince Charming or yeah. even the idea she's on this path. And to put someone who is so um, dynamic and could be have any version of could have decided to be married for da 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 or da, to choose a different a way of doing it. I think it's so important. I think it's so important to have that out there. I, I do think, um, you know, and it brings me back to what my next question was, which is, how did your experience? Because when you were a crime reporter, including on the Deadline Crime series, did that? How did that affect you emotionally? I mean, how did that influence your? How did that lifestyle influence your life? You know, it it really, especially with deadline crime, I think because that show was a tape show yes. and everything else I did was live and kind of in the moment, you'd spend 12 hours or so covering a story and then you had the, the live shot as a reporter or on air live. Deadline crime changed me in many ways that I am still trying to fully understand. And, and, and here's why. You know, I'm in my dining room right now. We would shoot in small like hotel rooms. Mm -hmm. And I'm in this room for hours talking with a parent who's lost a child or a family member. And it was really the closest that I came to what Jordan does with the character Pamela, the mother of one of the girls who's missing. Mm -hmm. There's a case that I covered in the San Diego area. And I still, to this day, hear from the mother of the victim. And we send each other messages from time to time. And that intimacy of deadline crime really, um, for a moment, made me not want to cover crime anymore. Wow. Um, the emotional impact of it, uh, it was a lot. And I was getting attached to people and keeping relationships with uh folks that I interviewed and having to check on them. And, and it wasn't a burden, but I felt it was a responsibility. And here I was trying to start my own family and, and trying to take care of myself, but then feeling the need uh, in some of these stories and the responsibility not just to walk away, right? Yeah. I just didn't want to say, okay, thank you for the interview. And my team will be in contact with you. 
I started to um, hate the goodbyes. Mm -hmm. Well, in some way, I think I'm really struck by what you're talking about of the small room of it all and the intimacy of it all. It's almost like in some ways, there's a therapist role that starts to take place. You're They're starting to confess to you. And then there's a responsibility with that confession that maybe it's hard to navigate after you walk out of that room. I think it's also they, A, many of those, many of the people with, with deadline crime knew that my sister was an unsolved murder, right? So they, they already know I'm in this club. Yep. Um, but also much like Jordan's character, you are a lifeline. You yeah. know, you are, you are an answer. You know, I've, I've had people look me in my eyes so deeply where it's, it's almost as if they're drowning in grief and they want me to pull them out and mm -hmm. I want to pull them out, but then I don't want to let go. Right. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm your surrogate daughter or your best friend because you've lost a best friend. And I felt the need too many times to try to fill that hole. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't fair to them or me. And so for a while, I didn't want to do the show, um, to be honest with you, uh, not the way I had done it. And yeah. I think that's a part of it. Yeah. Now, is that still Josephine that I hear? No, the that would be the food delivery from my mother. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's getting this is a real hole. Don't let all this pristine china that I splurged on for my 45th birthday fool you. This is a work in progress house, and somebody better get that food con. Um, Me too. But but well, I'm looking at, I have so many more questions and everyone can please jump in. We all got to eat. Someone just said, I'm with that. <laughs> all with that. We have some requests about Josephine. They yes. wanted, people want to know, Danielle wants to know what kind of bird Josephine yes. is. Josephine, who might make an appearance in an upcoming series, um, okay. a book. Uh, Josephine is a Senegal parrot who, mm -hmm. full disclosure, and I would bring her in other than, she loved me until I had my son. Mm -hmm. And now there's been a great betrayal and a great divide between us. And she's yep. uh, uh, now she loves everyone in the house except for me and baby Moses. I don't know. Oh <laughs> so, and I don't let her near. I don't know how that battle would end. He yep. has no interest in getting to know her. They have a clear understanding. But yep. Josephine is a Senegal parent. I've had birds my entire life. I, I in fact, oh, this is funny. We deviated from the book, but you should get to know me. Um, Everything has birds. Oh my gosh. I'm obsessed with birds, fun fact. And I don't wow. know, there, there's a swan gravy ladle over there. And so uh, and so I've had birds my entire life. I've had a bird for 17 years. And then Josephine Bird Crack got right before Moses was born. She's a Senegal parrot. Oh, I love it. Um, and she okay, would bite me if she was in here. <laughs> I do see some questions coming up, but I have some more. Can I ask? Please, yeah, yes, please, please. Okay. okay. I do want to talk about the city of Chicago, which yes. plays, um, a, I would think, you know, for me, um, setting is such a character um, that I, I strive to bring into the book as a character. And I was struck by what you did with Chicago in this book mm -hmm. and how Chicago really was in conversation with your characters right. in this book. Could you talk to me a little about um, Chicago and how, why you, why you decided to put it there and why it felt so important to you to address some of the conditions, social, political, economic that have been going on in that city? Yeah. Well, first I'll have to tell you, I, I see a comment that says, I played violin in the Chicago production when you were the voice of God. I was <laughs> the voice of God that handles the site. One of the most daunting experiences of my life. I don't know how many shows we did. My son has the playbill in his room right now, and I can't wait no. to tell him mom was the voice of God one day in, in Noah's uh, arc. Um, you should tell him you should just hold on to that. That that's right, right. the truth. Always the truth. Well, for me, Chicago, um, when I was there, I moved to Chicago when I was uh, 27. I left when I was 37. Very formative yeah. years of my career. Mm -hmm. And during that time in Chicago, you had Oprah Winfrey, the most famous Black woman in the world. Michael Jordan, the most famous black man in the world. And then not very far from where this case that I referenced happened, there was a man who was a community organizer who would become yeah. the most powerful man in the world and the first black president. And so the dynamic of Chicago is so fascinating from a news perspective where 
when you say Chicago for people who've never been there, they think crime. Oh, I saw that. You know, this person said Chicago's crime. And then inevitably it's the Al Capone comment or the Windy City. You know, you have all of the, and then it's, you know, the Bears. And it's Chicago. I, I tell my team with my daytime show, every show, I want people to feel the way. Mm -hmm. I want you to feel something about every show. Like it, love it, whatever it is. I want you to feel the way. And Chicago is the kind of city, whether you've been there or not, you have a feeling about it. Yep. it reacts, there's a reaction to it, um, particularly when it comes to crime and police brutality, sadly, when it comes yep. to crime and police brutality. So I felt for my experience as a first time writer, again, writing about a place I know intimately, but also how that city, I could have picked Dallas. I could have picked Philadelphia. I lived in both of those cities. Um, but Chicago needed to be the backdrop given what Jordan was discussing and covering. I felt it was the most relevant place. I felt that it was a, a visual, a, a, a mark that the reader would instantly be able to understand how and why Jordan would thrive in the city and how and why the irony of a city that is seen as a quote, black city a black girl could be invisible. Mm. Wow. Um, that's powerful. I, I, that brings me to another question that I was thinking about, which is, is there, because you're also a reporter, the crime here, and I, again, I'm really trying to avoid any spoilers, but is there something that you are hoping that the readers, your readers take away from this book in terms of um, something that you hope might change mm. after reading it. Because I felt, in addition to being very entertained, I felt quite moved by the book, which doesn't always happen when you're reading crime fiction. You know, I think you really accomplished that. Thank you. I think for me, um, keep in mind when I was writing this, uh, George Floyd had happened, but so had Breonna Taylor. Yeah. And far more people know the assassination of George Floyd than the assassination of Breonna Taylor. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, obviously, I don't want to compare what would be more terrifying. But I will say she was asleep in her bed. Right. The safest place. When we walk out of our homes, there's some part of us, I'm sure we assume a oh boy, a car. I mean, I live in busy New York City. I, these days, a bicyclist, anything. You know that safety is um, not guaranteed outside of your home. You know yeah. that. Yep. Inside of your home, it should be, right? Mm -hmm. And for me at the time, covering, but on my talk show, covering Breonna Taylor in a different way than I would have if I were in a newsroom or an MSNBC. It was again a reminder of the absence of true empathy when it mm. comes to black women. Mm. Um, and particularly that case where insert, I think any other race outside of a woman of color, and I mean black, brown, Latino, um, Asian, people would have been you would have known her name and we do know her name, but not to the degree we should. She was asleep in her home. Yeah. A warrant was executed for the wrong person. And she, an EMT worker. I mean, she couldn't have had a better background. I mean, that's the thing. It's so. And so that's a little bit of what I was, I think, feeling when I touched upon some of the background of, the young woman in the yeah. story. Also my own sister, people have asked me why I don't talk a lot about her case. Um, my sister had her own personal struggles and I did not want someone, some reporter to do a story and then do the, but this was the other side We're like, you know, mm -hmm. you know, she actually had, you know, this issue when she was 22 and then somebody said this and it, because none of it was relevant to what happened to her, not one bit of it, but you feel that fear that when the victim does not fit a certain profile, all of those other things become relevant. 
And so I think for this book, um, it's a fictional, you know, this is fictionalized. This is, but it is rooted in reality, right? Yeah. And so I try to, I don't want to cross any lines and I don't want to compare um, the story to real life, but it is truly inspired deeply by true stories. And at any moment, and look at where we are, yep. it becomes real. Yeah. And I could never have imagined that this conversation would happen at a time where the book is out and we're back at this crossroads again of who gets to be the lead, who gets to be the victim, and who do we see mm -hmm. as ourselves. It's so interesting when you say that, it's because there does, the idea that you have to be um, uh, a worthy victim even if what, you know, or like that you're, that you have, you know, cause it does, even with you think of Breonna Taylor in EMT had done all these things in her life. It was her apartment, even the, per like it was that it's insane. But then you ask the questions, well, what if that wasn't the case? She still should be safe in her apartment. And what we do to people in the moment of grief, when we demand, well, they are also supposed to be perfect in that way. Yeah. Um, I, I think that that's so interesting. I wanted to ask you about your writing process mm -hmm. because how did that look? Did you write in the morning? Did you write in the evening? Do you like writing? Do you like having written? Oh, how do you feel I, about it? I love it. You know, I, I, I've i been for 25 years of my career in morning TV. So it's mm -hmm. natural for me to wake up at dark 30, as I refer. Anything <laughs> before 4 a.m. is dark 30. Um, I love yeah, that's I my natural that. wake up time. Uh, I tell people, if you want me to wake up at 9 a.m., you can I, you give me the day because I yeah. cannot wake up at nine. It's I, I'd rather sleep the whole day away. Um, I so we at the time had our production shut down. Um, we were now in my home and uh, the show was being taped from my home. We were supposed to wrap this season up June first week in June, we extended it June 21st because the audience um, um, had responded to my, my journalism background and we'd shifted the daytime show to focus much more on that and cover story, stories related to COVID and what the world was. Um, and so I started to write, um, not a true outline, but I had a concept, right? I had a concept of what I wanted from this character. As I said, you know, I wanted her to in some ways be a superhero. I mean, this forensic background and being a journalist. But I, I, I said, I remember saying to someone, we believe a guy from Krypton worked at the Daily Planet, wrote yes. these stories, went inside of a booth, took off his jacket. But we can't believe a black woman was a forensic scientist and a journalist. Okay. Well, you know, again, and that was my first like, Nudge, like, okay, we're going to do this, Jordan. We're going to shake it up, right? Okay. Um, and I would use my iPhone, and I, I don't sleep well, and I'm sure that's another whole issue that I should talk about with someone. But I usually, um, my, my night crawlers seep in around 1 a.m., 2 a.m. So I have an idea in my head, speak it into my voice memo, get up at 5 a.m. and flush it out. Um, Sean Taylor was there for me to help me organize some of these thoughts because you know I'm writing scripts for my show and then I'm <laughs> writing this and so I'm clicking away with my my producers uh, for my show and I try to be present and read everything and all of the authors that come on because I want somebody to read my book they're going to do me so you know I yeah. give myself fully to that so my days of creativity were Saturday and Sunday mostly the whole day. Um, starting out in the morning and continuing on. Um, and now we, we have a rhythm of with the second book, Wednesdays, because I tape only one show on Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. And I would like my Saturdays back. So since I don't tape on Fridays, we have commit the entire Friday. But mm -hmm. as I, you know, as ideas and concepts and, and conversations pop into my head, I speak them into the voice memo. I send them to her. She, you know, jots it down and we just kind of flesh it out that way. But it wasn't, um, wasn't a difficult process because I talk for a living. So I was basically talking to myself. Um, growing up, I had the nickname, not necessarily 
and imagine dealing with a seven-year-old that you're constantly hearing, not necessarily. And I, and I was an only child for many years in the home and I played Monopoly by myself and chess. And so I've always had this vivid imagination. I've always had this ability to create and talk in my head. Now, the nuns who you know were my teachers did not always appreciate my very vivid imagination. <laughs> yeah. And that proved to be a challenge for my mother, but it now has allowed for me um, to tap into that kid who really, um, I'll tell you, uh, I've never shared this story. So my mother um, married the dad I was meant to have. My stepfather raised me. Mm -hmm. And I remember, and this is one of my deepest secrets I will share with everyone today. When I, my, there was this period of time where my mom was a single mom and raising me and I did not have a relationship with my biological father. And I literally would create stories of our meeting and hanging out and him coming to see me. And I would fantasize that we were at a grocery store and, and there he was, I'm like, hi, how are you? And wanting that relationship, one of the first um, works of fiction was a fantasized relationship. I've never told anyone this story. Mm -hmm. um, a fantasized relationship with my biological father. Mm -hmm. And that was my first I guess, little novel. Wow. That's amazing. That's, inc I, that's an incredibly powerful way to start writing. I, that's how it started. And it was this girl and her dad and me fantasizing what that must be like for this kid. And I, it was me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think I created this character much like that. It just from this place of innocence. Um, even at my age and my experience, I, I approached it with a spirit of innocence and, and not knowing. And so that's why the writing process, I know, listen, number two will probably have a writer's block and all the, the things that normally come with creating. But this one um, moment in time, if you will, that I used to create this, it was very much in the space of that childhood um, novel uh, that I created. Well, I was, I was just about to say that that's, it's just so touching. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, and someone else just said, thank you for sharing that very moving. Um, you mentioned now with the new book, Wednesdays and Fridays are the day. Yeah. Someone asked in the chat, can you tell us what is happening in this next book? Um, well, already, of course, as you know, Jordan is um, trying to figure out her career. She's now um, had some success and is tempted by the lure of being the anchor. You know, every not every reporter. There are many reporters who are quite happy being reported. But, you know, the the, the natural thing for a reporter um, at some point is to wonder, do they want to be in the anchor chair, even if it's just for the chick? Because that's where the check is. But that's, do you, what do you want to do? So she's, uh, she's like, no, do I want to be there for the check or do I want to be in the world still? Because you do lose a bit of, uh, of yourself when you solely, well, not solely, when you decide I'm going to be the anchor. You're not assigned to the streets anymore. Mm -hmm. And she loves being in the streets. And so now I can reveal that she um, is, it's brought to her attention this disappearance of, a woman who happens to be a mom who happens to be white and Jordan is not a mom and she's not white. And will she have the same attachment to this case as she did with Macy James? She could see herself in Macy James. She could see that experience she has in some part of her life been that kid. But what I wanted to tap into honestly, Laura was this notion of womanhood and motherhood, right? Mm -hmm. I was, I've been a woman for 51 years. I've been a mom for two. And so often I, when I first had my son, I, I would have friends say, welcome to the club. And I'd say, well, I don't want to be in the club. I just want to be Tamara. I don't want to be you. And I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to talk about this kid all the time. And I don't yeah. know, he's cute. Here's a picture. But, you know, I still want us to have our girlfriend vibe. Yeah. And when we conflate womanhood with motherhood, how mm -hmm. many do we leave behind? Right. Yeah. And so I wanted to explore that part of Jordan's life. And would she be able to 
turn to the mirror and judge herself in the way she's judged other reporters for not caring about Macy. You know, you don't care about her. You're not black, you know, and now she's not a mom. She's not, you know, why does she understand? Now for me in my career, I've been fortunate to have people connect with me from all walks of life. You know, my mother lives in the reddest part of the reddest state. And when I go home, there are people who've never seen me wait for it on MSNBC. I wonder why. They didn't know I was on MSNBC. But That's not their know, channel. Right? They're like, what is that channel? It's like, yeah. put the cross. But they know me from Deadline Crime. Yeah. Or the time I was out with Bear Grylls in the wild. Mm -hmm. And so they know me for those things. And so I've been fortunate to be, you know, in Harlem and people go, girl, go get them. Don't let NBC fire you. You got this. And then be in the reddest part of my state or in some small town in Arkansas. And then you hear this unmistakable Southern drawl of Tamara and you yeah. turn around and you're like, now who would have thunk that? Yeah. Look at you, you know, and there they are hugging me with a Confederate flag shirt on. I'm like, okay, we're in, you know, we're in. You see, we're you know, I respect like, whatever you got going on. Yeah. So I've been fortunate to have that wide range at this point in my career. Jordan hasn't had that exposure yet, mm -hmm. right? She hasn't felt what I have felt, which is a connection from people from all walks of life. She's yeah. been a beat reporter, mostly assigned to stories where she's on the south side of Chicago and now she's exploring. Obviously she cares, yeah. but does she have connection? And those are two different things. Caring yeah. and connection are two different things. And mm -hmm. so I'm trying to dig into that. Oh, I love that. That's so interesting. Caring and connection are, they're so different. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought about it that way. Um, that's really, really interesting. Um, Someone quest has a question, which was, what was an experience you had where you learned words and language have power? And oh. the second part of that would be, did that experience help shape your writing? Yes, I think, you know, that was something I recognized very early on in my life with labels, right? Um, being an underdog and, and being the daughter of a single mom, you know, I recognized that words um, can destroy and they can make you feel less than. Yeah, I even remember when I was a kid getting in the gifted and talented program. That changed, I'm gifted and talented, right? It's like, wait a minute, you can't tell me nothing, right? <laughs> and so uh, whatever gifted and talented meant back then, uh, I just remember my mom got me a test and the next day I know I'm in the gifted and talented program. And wait, was, that, was that before or after not necessarily? That was when they were trying to figure out how to deal with this child. And someone said, she can't be quiet. And Ms. Hall, she talks a lot and she's really a handful. And my mother said, um, oh, I remember I got a report card. And, and you know, back then the, the nuns would label talks at inappropriate times. <laughs> it was like, check, 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 check. And that was like my thing. And I, and I always came home with a report card that said talks at inappropriate time. Yeah. And my mother tried to figure out clearly what to do with me and, and said, well, let's test her. Maybe, you know, she needs to be challenged more. And as a result, I ended up in the gifted and talented program, mm -hmm. a label words, yes. words yes. that matter. So yeah. I think I learned that very on early in my life and how it's impacted my career and even this novel, trying as best I can to make sure that the words are not there to fill the air. Mm. I, and it's hard to do that. I mean, in TV, dead air, oh, you're know, like, wait. And having the power uh, to control yourself and know when to use the word mm. or words. Wow. That's amazing. Um, okay. I'm going to just look here and see, and if not, I'm going back to my questions. I'm trying to, I'm trying, I've I literally, this is, I just want to, I have three pages left and it's, oh. it's 747. You're I, it. I hope you all are getting comfortable. Um, if anyone else has a question, put it, put it in the chat. Otherwise I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna keep going. Um, uh, okay. This is another one I had to ask you. I'm just going to find out where I, where I like this. Okay. Okay. I have, okay. I want to go back into the story in two different ways. 
Um, I want to talk to you about research, mm -hmm. how you approach research and how you think about it differently because so much of one hat that you wear involves research, you know, mm -hmm. yes. but, but the research in this book, everything felt the forensic research, all of it. I mean, I would think that that was what you do for a living. It was so detailed. So how did you do that? Well, uh, for me, a, a lot of that also goes back to my deadline crime days. Yes. You know, with deadline crime, I did spend a lot of time with um, different specialists. I remember being in Florida and there was a case where um, a woman was murdered and the car was burned and this, and I, I interviewed the, the, the um, investigator on the side of the road where she stood and a tiny napkin caught her eye wow. in the burned out debris. And she explained to me what that felt like to look over. He's like, what is that? And instantly knew on the side of the road that it meant something. And I mean, you're like, whoa, like I probably, any of the rest of us would have been so focused on the charred out car. Yeah. Right? And it had DNA on it and it led to the arrest of the person responsible. Wow. Um, so for me, I, I looked over old notes from stories. I keep a lot of my old notes, especially cases that are just stunning like that. Um, we did a lot of research on old crimes, uh, like the, the traditional ones, um, mm -hmm. particularly with serial killers. Mm -hmm. Um, the Atlanta child murders still remains one of the most fascinating cases to me and dug in a lot on some of the information there. I, um, with Sean, called different friends and different sources that we've used in the past. Sean mm -hmm. worked on Crime Beat um, as the scanner traffic, you know, person. And we called in and asked a lot of folks that we'd work with, not on air, you know, mm -hmm. retired detectives. There's a retired detective that I adore out of Florida um, that, that actually tipped me off on one of the, um, an unforgettable deadline crime called him and I didn't have to search, you know, I had to Google search investigators. I knew enough of them uh, to call and work with them. I think some of my, my, my most surprising research came with technology mm -hmm. um, because this is 1997 and I'm like, wait a minute, did the iPhone do that back then? Or mm -hmm. you, th you think of the iPhone now, like you believe it existed like this since it came out and it did it. Yeah. Um, and technology did. And even down to, I remember 2008, I moved here. The big headline was Obama didn't want to get rid of his Blackberry. I remember <laughs> that like, oh my God, he's got to get rid of his Blackberry. <laughs> if he can't get rid of his Blackberry, he can't be president. I mean, that's how, and now I don't know anyone who has a Blackberry, right? So yeah. I think they've just re brought it back or whatever, but um, reintroduced it. So it was more about technology and, and um, what was happening, but the the beats of reporting, what she does, thankfully, I know very well. Yeah. And I probably, if I picked a different occupation for her, this book wouldn't be here and it would have taken much longer um, to write. But again, being new to this space and knowing what I know, I tell my team all the time, even now, um, I know what I know and I'm yep. very comfortable with what I don't know. Right. And that's why I've been able to hopefully grow in, in, in the things that I've, I've taken on, mm -hmm. I will speak with great confidence only about what I know. Mm -hmm. And this is what I know. I know Jordan's life. I know Jordan's world. And that's why I chose this as my first novel. And it sounds like you have a little bit of um, the midnight disease, which speaking of being mm -hmm. gifted and talented, it's a sign that if you wake up at that time, it's um, mm -hmm. it's a sign of, um, of, of having like some mental gifts, because I guess that I read somewhere there's something um, there's like a low back here, something that doesn't quite shut off if your brain is always, uh, so you can just tell yourself that the next time you wake up. But um, <laughs> do you read a lot? Do you have time to read a lot? And what I, have you been like, were there books that were helpful to you when you were writing this? And, you know, I, I love the character Easy Rollins. I love uh, Walter mm. Mosley. I like that, that sexiness, that, you know, that private detective, you know, that kind of thing always resonated with me. Um, a lot. Um, honestly, 
you know, I read so much for the show that I tend to absorb the research information like a reporter across the board. I read a recipe like a reporter. Yeah. And so, okay. Like, okay, let's just let me investigate. This, <laughs> this makes sense. Um, so for me, one of the things I tried to be mindful of, I didn't want to copy, right? I didn't want to say, oh, I'm such a fan of Laura's and I'm gonna copy everything she does. I, just as I did not approach my talk show that way. Of course I adore, who doesn't adore Oprah? But I didn't mm -hmm. say, and hello, I'm Oprah. And I couldn't do that. I didn't want to imitate. Yeah, um, yeah. Because if, if you imitate, you don't learn. And, oh, and I, I love feel that. That, that I, I need to write learn. down. I love that. I love that. Sorry, go on. I have to. So, like, my memory. so I try to really push down natural influences yes. so that I could try to deliver this novel in its truest form of my creativity. Mm -hmm. And then that will allow me to grow. Yeah. I think writers fall into two categories. I, I really fall into your category here, which is when I'm working on something, I can't read anything yeah. at all in that genre. So right. if I'm working on something like a thriller, that means I'm reading memoirs that have nothing to, you know, about 18th century flowers or whatever, yeah. something so far, so far removed. And then there are other people, but I never thought about it that way, but I love the idea that you just said, you know, imitation does not allow growth, like to really sort of- Yeah, I thing. think it's true. So for me, most of the reading while creating this book really was Llama Llama Red Pajama, yeah. Blue Moon, uh, Mickey, Mickey Loves His Friends, uh, what was the other? You know, that's where we live, you know, in yeah. Elmo's Playland. And it yeah. was good to have that contrast and good to have that, whew, right, this is easy. I don't have, I mean, right now I'm, deeply in the throes of the book how to potty train in three nights or whatever it is oh wow so that's been great for me in the second series and so yeah. that's i mean it also keeps me balanced one of the things we you know it, with jordan um without giving too much away she has a ritual that she mm -hmm. needs to perform after the day is done i have a ritual um, that I perform very different. Hers is at the end, mine was at the beginning before I covered a story. What did I do to armor up and to prepare myself um, to discuss this crime with family members and also to honor the person who died. And so these rituals, and many reporters do have rituals, right? Um, mm -hmm. After deadline crime, I would sometimes go to, there's a, a steakhouse here uh, and I would get their, this huge steak and mm. I would get the mashed potatoes and I get their Brussels sprouts and I get the biggest glass of like Cabernet, like the heaviest mm. red wine that you could imagine. And I needed to indulge mm -hmm. in that way because it was comforting. It was like, it was just, I, and I still don't fully have the words to describe what it did for me, but it was a ritual and the potatoes were so creamy. And it's almost as if this meal tastes so different than any other that I had prior to. And it was giving my body this incredible rich comfort that I needed after witnessing and talking about such trauma. It was the ultimate indulgence. I deserve. Oh, I love that. Um, I want to point everyone also to the, the side where you can see a link to buy this fabulous book. I imagine a lot of you haven't read it yet because it just came out yesterday. Do you I, know I haven't had a chance to even see the book? I haven't had that 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 moment where the author goes into the bookstore and sees there, but my yeah. husband has. My husband sent me a photo yesterday. I've been on set um, mm -hmm. all day yesterday and all day today. And so I had a chance to, there was a bookstore on the way home, but I wanted to make sure I was here with you on time. I was like, I'm not gonna be like Laura. <laughs> and so I uh, I didn't get a chance to go. So tomorrow, hopefully I'll be able to get a chance to uh, go by a bookstore and do that picture of myself in. But I have not seen the book and it, I have them here, but I've not yeah. seen it in real life at, in a store. So it's just crazy. And I've been signing and it's such a pleasure to sign these books and I'll tell you, um, because I, you don't know if you'll have the opportunity again, right? This is the mm -hmm. first novel could be your last. And when I was signing the books, and there are thousands of books, 
I try to stay so present with each signature, recognizing that someone was going to take that book. They were going to hold that book. It would be on the side of their bed. It might even be on the bookshelf to read a little bit later for the vacation you're planning in December or whatever. And I, I, I fantasize going back to even my childhood, what it was like for that person to get that book and open it and see my signature. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to never fall into the, which is okay. I mean, you get, you got a lot of things going on in your life. But for me, because this was my first opportunity to sign my novel or a novel with my name in it, it was really special. And I thought very deeply about the people who would take their money and, you know, buy the book and open it because it's signed by me. I love that so much. And I just want to end by saying two things that I see in the comments here, which is someone else um, echoing, Georgina's echoing what I said. It is really good. Looking forward to the next Jordan Manning book. I will say that I am going to um, be bothering you, hopefully, for an early copy of the new one. <laughs> Oh, I need, I need your, now I'm like, listen, the sea legs, I've got to get, get going here. I can't wait. I can't wait. And everyone, I will just say like, I loved this book. I started it on Saturday. I was done on Monday. Like it is a page turner. Go in the, go on the side here, support Warwick, support Tamron. This book will not disappoint you. You'll be done. You'll be up all night like Tamron because you won't be able to do it. But it's Thank wonderful. You. Thank um, you. I just appreciate your support. I, I appreciate all of the independent booksellers, um, the bookstores owned by women, all of these things. This experience, had I not taken this leap of faith, I wouldn't have an opportunity right now to talk to you. I wouldn't have had the opportunity to thank, you know, small booksellers and independent booksellers who are out there still hustling and still doing their thing and still believing and someone walking into the store and opening it and feeling the book, all of those things. So I am so grateful. Thank you for everyone in the comments. Jojo, clearly the bird has gone to sleep. So I think that means it's a wrap. When, when the Senegal parrot shuts down, that's when you know the night's over. <laughs> well, congratulations. Um, I'm so excited for you. I'm so excited for all of us that this is the first of many that we're going to get to read of Jordan Manning. So uh, my um, only thing that I hope to change is the next time we'll be in person. Yes, me too. Me too. Uh, thank you.